All right, so Mark has uh, given 600 presentations, over 1,000 business owners, and 120 weekend seminars. So uh, he comes to us with a fabulous story and information to share. Again, Mark LeBlanc. It's hard to imagine, uh, 30 years ago, I was 22 years old, and I'm one of the lucky ones. I found out that professional speaking could be a career. And I never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would be uh, 30 years later sitting in, such a, in front of such a great group um, here in downtown Minneapolis. I, uh, some of my mentors, some of you might remember, Don Sheehan and, and Bob Montgomery and Leo Hauser and Larry Wilson. And I got connected to a group called the National Speakers Association. Some of my colleagues are here. And, it's been an incredible ride, and I've been on my own my entire adult life. I had a job once for about six months, and I found out at a very early age that I was unemployable. And I've had some good years. I've had some not-so-good years. I've had a couple of great years and, and a couple that were just awful. And any of you that have been uh, at the helm of your ship here for 10, 20, 30 years probably could relate to the ups and downs and the challenges of change and the things that we navigate on a regular basis. Um, Rick shared in the introduction that if he was hopeful that you might learn something. Um, I am too. Um, <laughs> and, and that you might uh, have something that you walk away with uh, and might put into practice, or, you know, something that you might take action on. And it's true. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went on a short 500-mile walk across northern Spain. It's called the Camino de Santiago. Uh, it's one of the three great pilgrimages of the world, Rome, Jerusalem, and Santiago in northern Spain. Have any of you ever heard of the Camino? A uh, number of you. Um, made a little bit more famous, a little bit more popular in the last year or two by a movie uh, starring Martin Sheen titled The Way. Um, if you're a movie goer or a movie renter, it would make for a great, uh, uh, a great movie at home now uh, to rent it or on demand. The Way, starring Martin Sheen. And I've been, uh, my dream was really to do what I'm doing uh, with you here today. And I made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I joined this group called the National Speakers Association 30 years ago and had a number of ups and downs along the way, but I, I hung in there. And a couple of years ago, I had the honor and privilege of serving as the national president of the National Speakers Association. It's a volunteer position. I was on the board for about eight years before that. I was the president of the Minnesota uh, Speakers Association in 1989-1990. And NSA is a group of about 3,000 speakers and no listeners. <laughs> Which essentially means that if one of our members has a problem, we have no trouble articulating it to the president. And it was a, a, great, a great honor for me this year and, and, uh, uh, to serve as national president. And I completed my term of service in August of 2008. And I was a wrestler in northern Minnesota, fertile Minnesota. And we have a, an expression in wrestling called leaving it all out on the mat. And when my term of service as the national president was over, I had left it all out on the mat. And our national convention was in New York City. I thought, I thought that I would just go home and rest up for a couple of days or a week, and I'd be right back to center and, you know, on to the next challenge, the next project, the next assignment. And 30 days later, I was about as burned out as you could possibly be. I had nothing. I had no energy. I had no drive. I had no creativity. For the first time in my life, I understood what it really meant to be burned out. And I shaved my head bald. I thought that would be a cool thing to do. 
Um, and I put, a back, I put a backpack on for the first time in my life. And what do you suppose happens when you put a backpack on for the first time in your life? This is the audience interaction part of the, of the program. What, what, what do you suppose happens when you put a backpack on for the first time in your life? Okay, I'm going to pretend I heard the answer. <laughs> At least the one I'm looking for. Um, first, you put too much in your backpack. And I'll never forget the morning that I was going to fly to Paris, France and um, start my journey. It was as if my brain went right out my ear. There are no stores in Spain. And I just started grabbing things. And I put too much in my pack. And I flew to Paris, France. And I took a train down to a little village in southern France called saint jean pied port which is the most popular route or starting spot of the Camino. People have been walking the Camino for over a thousand years. And on average, a hundred people a day, every day of the year, start this walk. So if you can imagine a bald, burned out Marc LeBlanc with a backpack on with too much in it, and I'm about to start a 500 mile walk. Not the best time uh, <laughs> uh, to start on a 500 mile walk. And the Camino, you're up in over three mountains in 30 days, and the Camino doesn't break you in gently. You're not even leaving the little village of St. John, and you're already starting to ascend Mount Lapeter. And uh, you'll cross over Mount Lapeter and into northern Spain on, on your first day. And I hadn't gone two miles, and I thought that I was going to die. <laughs> and it had started to rain. After about two miles, I thought, I, I, I started to look for a place to rest or sit down or a rock or stump or something. And I thought, if I was a farmer along this way, I would set up a bench alongside the road. Maybe serve lemonade or iced tea. I mean, people, 100 people a day, last 1,000 years. I mean, they're going to need something. And I hadn't gone another hundred yards around a bend, and there was a bench alongside the road. And I couldn't believe that I was stopping for my first rest break after just two miles. And the bench was actually set back uh, in the ditch. And I took my backpack off, and it's raining, and two miles into it, and um, I noticed that I was actually sitting in a little bit of a dump. because. People had already started to discard things, Cl clothes, I mean, extra socks. I mean, I had five books in my backpack. I mean, I had all kinds of things, that uh, projects I was going to do along the way. And I'm looking around, and there's all stuff laying all over. And, and um, I hadn't started crying yet. And I sat there and I began to think about my life and my work and the, the good and the not so good and the great. And uh, all of a sudden, it dawned on me, I had 498 miles to go. And that is instant depression. And I began to think about uh, how I might get out of it. Right? Maybe I could take a bus to Barcelona, just hang out for five weeks. I mean, no one would ever know. <laughs> and I don't know how long I sat on that bench, and I stood up and put my backpack on. And 33 days uh, later, 500 miles and over a million steps across northern Spain, I arrived in front of the Cathedral of Santiago. It was one of the most grueling and uh, possibly the most profound experiences of my life. The last four years have been the absolute best years of my career, the absolute best years of my business, the best years of my life. <clears throat> and I think, for me, walking the Camino, now not that you have to go to Spain and walk 500 miles to create a turning point um, in the direction of your dream, 
But somehow that experience and some of the things that I learned along uh, that route uh, made an incredible difference uh, in my business and in my personal life. And back on that first night when I'd gone up and over Mount Lapeter and I was having dinner with about a dozen other walkers and we're all scared. We don't really know what we're in for, <clears throat> all trying to be tough. Um, and I met these three women from England and one woman in particular, her name was Judith. And she didn't really look like a walker. I didn't tell her that. I mean, that's your inner voice. Here I am, tough guy, and I'm dying after one day. And I looked at Judith, and I, uh, I was there to walk the Camino in one stretch. And a lot of people will walk the Camino in stages, one week a year for five uh, years or something like that. And this was Judith's third year, third week, third year. And I asked Judith, I said, what have you learned along the way? And she looked at me and she said, Mark, I've learned one thing. She said, no matter how badly your feet are bruised and blistered and bleeding, and they did, she said, you can always take one more step. You can always take one more step. And I hung on to that one more step for over a million steps. <clears throat> now, I've had the honor and the privilege of growing up with some of the best speakers and authors. Um, I've learned from, I've, li I've listened to, I've learned from, I've lunched with people like Zig Ziglar and Og Mandino and Ira Hayes and Cavett Robert and Jim Tunney and, and you name it. Um, I've heard these people, I've heard every miserable motivational quote in the history of the world. <clears throat> But nothing ever inspired me more than the words of the great Judith, you can always take one more step. And as I said, I hung on to that for over a million steps and I came back and uh, I wrote an article when I came back. And by the way, I was gone in the fall of 2008 when the economy sort of took a little bit of a downturn uh, for some people and maybe some people in here. And I wrote an article titled, don't you dare blame the economy. And Siemens booked me 13 times to bring that message around the United States and Chase Bank booked me 15 times to bring that message to entrepreneurs and business owners around the United States. And it wasn't designed to make light of the challenges of change and what so many of us uh, experience. But I think when our backs are against the wall, we find out what we're made of. And my message was, now is the time to be more creative and innovative than ever before. Now is the time to be more creative and innovative than ever before. Um, I noticed the food today. I went vegan for Lent, and uh, I'm looking around, and the food looks awfully wonderful here. I mean, was it good? Why don't you give the Minneapolis Club a round of applause? <laughs> um, it, it's amazing. Your plates look incredible. In fact, it reminds me, it reminds me of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday of all uh, for what it means. And um, I don't know about you, but what do people typically do on Thanksgiving Day? Watch football. Uh, you know, sit down, eat. What, ha what typically happens when you sit down to this uh, incredible meal and buffet or uh, what tends to happen? You what? You talk with the family? Go to, you eat too much? Sometimes we not only eat too much, we eat some things we don't want to eat. <laughs> Think about it. We often put too much on our plate, and I like to think of it this way. Um, we often treat every day like a Thanksgiving meal, and we put too much on our plate. We put needs on our plate 
we put those things that we should do on our plate when what we really would like is to do more of what we want to do and top it off with what we love to do and the types of customers and clients that we really love to serve. But as on Thanksgiving Day, instead of doubling up on the things that you want, I mean, just play with me here. I mean, there's probably three or four things you love on the menu. But you take this because you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, and you, 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 you take other stuff that you don't really want, and you, you put too much on, when, again, we really would like to double up on what we want to do and what we love to do. Does that make any sense? And every day we do the same thing. We're juggling a lot of balls, we're wearing a lot of hats, we get up in the morning and we fill our plate with need, what we need to do, and an unhealthy serving of shoulds. What is it that you want to do? In fact, that's the million dollar question. In fact, every once in a while I say something good. I'm not sure where it comes from, but I feel something good coming on. And you might want to write this down. What do you specifically want to sell more of? What is the one program, the one product, the one service, the one presentation, that if you could do more of that, it would add more color to your day and more meaning to your world and your work? What's the one thing? Strategic question for those of you that are in business. What are you known for? What are you known for? What's the one thing that if you created a path and a plan to be at or near that? In fact, we're already into early March. I'm going to give you a tip. You don't even need to write this one down. Uh, throw away the concept of the calendar year and the annual goal. They're good for nothing. Throw away the concept of the calendar year and the annual goal. They are good for nothing. And what I would suggest to you is that you create a snapshot of a model month. Play with me here a little bit. Uh, let's just say your, uh, you know, your goal is, is X. Just divide it by 12. Call that your monthly optimistic number. What do you want to generate every 30 days? In fact, I think the secret to your success lies in the phrase, every 30 days. We know, we know that New Year's resolutions tend not to last. How long do New Year's resolutions typically last? How long? 21, day, 21 days? About a week? I had someone say to me not long ago, until my next meal. <laughs> We, we know that New Year's resolution, and we're entrepreneurs, and we know that New Year's resolutions tend not to last. In fact, um, even salespeople, if the truth were known, for those of you that manage salespeople, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes here, but if the truth were known, most salespeople do not even want to hit their targets. Because you know why? What are they going to be rewarded with? A bigger target. That's the truth. So even in sales, salespeople will only give a little bit less than their best effort because they know that they're going to be rewarded with a bigger, a bigger number, a bigger target. And at the beginning of every year, you are back at the bottom of the mountain. And I've never met an entrepreneur or a salesperson who set a smaller goal for the coming year. Chances are very good that you felt better on January 1st of this year, no matter if you had a good year or a not so good year in 2012, right? You were very good at letting go of whatever did or did not happen, and you're right back at the bottom of the mountain, and you're looking at even a larger mountain. And then by about the 5th of January, you're sort of back your enthusiasm, your spirit of renewal, uh, your momentum begins to fade and fizzle, 
and you're right back to the same attitudes, habits, beliefs, and behaviors uh, that you experienced in the coming year. Imagine this. What if you could recapture that spirit every 30 days? Throw away the concept of the calendar year and the annual goal and look at creating a snapshot of a model month. And then if you can create a path and a plan to be at or near that model month every 30 days, you will have a greater likelihood. In fact, jot that phrase down, greater likelihood. You will have a greater likelihood in recapturing that spirit. So imagine if the first five days of February you felt good and then you lost it. In the first five days of March, you felt good again. And you could have 60 good days a year. I mean, you don't need to wait a year um, to reset your counters to zero and feel good again. I'm going to give you a little focus um, exercise. And that is, um, what I want you to do is I want you to jot down, for those of you that have something to write with and something to write on, I want you to jot down. And we'll, you, can, you can use this formula from any particular perspective. Um, but for today, I want to use it as a gross revenues perspective. Just write down what your monthly optimistic number might be. I mean, don't, don't write the word optimistic. Write your number down. You can write it small. You can write it in code um, so the person next to you doesn't see it. But get it out of your head and on paper. I was coaching a small business owner in St. Louis Park uh, about 12 or 13 years ago, and I drove away from that uh, coaching session, and I thought, I should do some of this crap that I want my clients to do. <laughs> and and I, pulled, I pulled into the Perkins restaurant in, uh, off of Highway 100 and, and Eden. Is it Eden? or uh, Yeah, Eden Boulevard. Uh, the Perkins restaurant, I took out a pad of paper and I thought, I took a deep breath and I thought, what would my monthly optimistic number be? And I, I wrote it down. And what do you think happened in that moment? Again, this is the audience interaction part <laughs> of the program. What do you think happened in that moment? Had Pardon? Had I had an epiphany. I programmed myself to go for that number. I started organizing around that number. I was scared to death. <laughs> because all of a sudden, I had to think differently. All of a sudden, I had to take action differently. I had always operated with an annual goal. And the annual goal will let you off the hook. I don't care if you get a great idea or two here today or either listening to me or somebody at your table, you are less likely to take action on it tomorrow if you walk out of here and say, well, yeah, he wasn't too bad. I've heard better speakers. Yeah, he was pretty good. I uh, kind of like that Camino story. Um, but I, you know, I'm going to stick with my, and my goal this year is X. You are less likely to take action on it tomorrow. And all of a sudden, I looked at that number and I thought, I need to think differently. I need to take act, I need to make my decisions differently. I need to take action differently. I need to market myself a little bit differently. I might need to raise my fees or look at my menu differently, uh, charge a little bit more, or market myself a little bit more effectively as well as a little bit more consistently. And then, I don't know if it was in month two or month three, but all of a sudden I did it. I booked my optimistic number. And what do you suppose happened then? I raised it. I stopped doing what it took to book it because now I had work to deliver. Now I had work to deliver. And about 90 days later, of course, my cash flow went up and then all of a sudden my cash flow started to go down. And I began to realize that there are three tracks in being in business for yourself. You have your booking track, you have your delivery track, and you have your 
money track. And our ego runs on the delivery track of our business. If you ask somebody, how are you doing, he or she typically responds with what they have or do not have on their calendar coming up in the next 30, 60, 90 days, or maybe what they've completed in the last 30, 60, 90 days. That's your ego speaking. Our emotions run on our cash flow. How many of you feel better when you have money in the bank? <laughs> of course. I want you to forget about the cash flow side of your business. I want you to forget about the delivery side of your business. And my challenge to you in the next 30, 60, 90 days, shore up your booking track. Shore up your booking track. Create a booking machine in your business. That's where your focus should be. In fact, I've never had an entrepreneur overbook themselves. Nobody's ever come to me and said, you know, Mark, it worked. I overbooked myself. I don't know what I'm going to do. You will figure that out. We always figure out the, how to deliver it. Not always easy. We might need to reach out for help, find some different additional vendors, or hire some additional staff. But we will figure out the delivery track of our business. And I'm barring any really bad decision, as entrepreneurs, we're survivors. We will figure out the money track in our business. Not always pretty. We may need to borrow more money than we would like to. We may need to use a credit card now and then. Um, and you have. You may be unique in God's eyes. You're not in mine. <laughs> I've seen it all. And I've never, I've never heard an excuse that I didn't have a relationship with myself. We fight the good fight every single day, and we fill up our plate with too many things that we need to do and too many things that we should do when what we really would like is to double up more on what we want to do and do it with the customers and create the relationships that we want to be with and love to be with. I want you to think about that. As you move forward in the next 30, 60, 90 days, how might you shore up your booking track? And here's a little exercise I call it. It's one of my nine best practices. Um, if any of you have ever had a problem with focus um, on a daily basis, blink at me. OK, you don't have to raise, just blink. Okay. <laughs> Okay, because we're pulled in so many different directions, and we're often pulled, um, I, call it, I call them tangents disguised as opportunities. So if you really want to create a booking machine, here's a best practice that can help you with that. I call them the AM, PM questions. In the morning, your AM question is, what am I doing today to book my optimistic number of X? What am I doing today to book my optimistic number of X. At the end of the day, your PM question is, what did I do today to book my optimistic number of X? What did I do today to book my optimistic number of X? And find a sliver of focus. Ground your day or build your day on a sliver of focus that will move you in the direction of your dream, however you define it. And all of a sudden, having a monthly optimistic number, asking the AM, PM questions every day will help you make your decisions on a daily basis better. Because every single day, you place four bets. Where am I going to bet my time? Where am I going to bet my energy? Where am I going to bet my money? And where am I going to bet my creativity where it will have a greater likelihood in helping me do more of what I want to do and, and what I love to do. Take a deep breath. Let it out. There is a trap that entrepreneurs often fall into. I call it the perfection trap. If you have ever been challenged by the perfection trap, 
We want to dot every I. We want to cross every T before we take it to the marketplace. We want the perfect website. Uh, gosh, as soon as we get our social media plan in place, uh, we get new marketing materials and tools, uh, then we're going to hit it hard. If you're challenged ever by the perfection trap, I have a little chiropractic adjustment for your brain. And the perfection trap adjustment for your brain is done is better than perfect. Done is better than perfect. Let that be the mantra that drives you in moving forward. Um, about, let's see, we're March 7th here uh, today. March 17th, 1996, March, uh, 17 years ago, got a telephone call. It's my birthday, uh, March 17th. Um, I'd love to come back here for lunch. Um, <laughs> I've got some favorite restaurants here in downtown Minneapolis. Um, March 17th is my birthday. 17 years ago, I got a telephone call um, that my dad had had a massive stroke. And we didn't know what a stroke was. He was 61 years old. And uh, my parents live in Fertile, Minnesota. And that day, drove up to All True Hospital in Grand Forks, having no clue what we would be facing. And my dad wasn't expected to live uh, even three days. In fact, the doctor even said, you might as well go home. He's, he's not going to make it. And if he does, He's probably going to end up a vegetable. Okay? I don't know where that term came from. I wish we could somehow banish that term, but it seems to be a, a common term in that situation. And um, My dad lived, and he's still alive today, 17 years later. My dad is my best friend. And I call my dad every morning from wherever I am, and I, I could probably count on two, three, four hands in the last 17 years that I haven't uh, been able to reach him in the morning. And uh, my dad is a piece of work. Uh, his attitude is great. His emotions are great. He's paralyzed on the left side of his body. My dad was like, I'm sure many of you, in many respects, uh, but my dad was also not a saver. On the day of his stroke, my mom and dad had nothing set aside for their retirement. About a month before my dad's stroke, he called me and he said, Mark, I'm not going to retire. And I wanted to say, well, you're not really in a position to retire. Um, but he said, he goes, I've had some good years. I've had some not so good years. I've had a few bad years. About the only great thing that I've done or that my, your mother and I have done is raise four great kids and you. <laughs> And, and he said, I'm going to give the next 10 years everything that I've got. And a month later, he had a career-ending stroke. My mom and dad owned two businesses in fertile Minnesota. And my mom was scared to death. She called me. Uh, you know, we had about a year of transition. We had to uh, sell their home, have an auction sale, move them into a one-level home. Um, uh, it, was, it was an incredibly difficult year, and my mother was scared to death. And she called me about six months after my dad's stroke and said, Mark, I need to borrow $5,000 in tears. And I said, Mom, no problem. She said, I'll pay you back. I said, Mom, don't worry about it. And I overnighted a check for 5000